Sam si som zručil, že sa lebo odbola môj.
for that um, Quran recitation. Please uh, recite a lot salawat. For any sisters who wish to listen live to the lecture, please feel free to join the rest of the sisters on the men's side. Salam alaikum brothers and sisters and respected scholars and viewers online. My name is Nagina Shasmand and on behalf of Youth Section, I would like to welcome you all to our program tonight. Before we begin tonight's lecture, I'd like to make a few announcements. A reminder for the annual Nazareth Bibi Zainab for All Sisters, it's being held this, this, this Sunday, December 2nd. 
Another reminder is that on Sunday, December 9th, there will be the second annual Interfaith Hussein Day at 3.30 p.m. and 5.30 p.m. located at Central Peel Secondary School, organized by Waliul Asir. You can RSVP at events at walialasir.ca. Starting January 2013, there will be classes Islam 101 for adults, for sisters held every Saturday from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. in the youth section room. Sisters between the ages of 18 to 45 are welcome. Space is limited, so please register with either Sister Zara Hazara or Brother Mahmoud Zarabi. Classes are free and will be held by Sister Sabra. Last but not least, we kindly ask everyone to keep their cell phones on silent. Tonight, Youth Section is proud to welcome Haj Hassanin Rajabali as our guest lecturer. Brother Rajabali is no stranger to our community as he has impacted the lives of several youth here, and we are delighted that he is with us tonight. Haj Hassanin Rajabali is a popular speaker currently living in Dearborn, Michigan, and has traveled worldwide to lecture on Islam. He is a graduate from the University of Colorado with a degree in molecular, and molecular biology and psychology. Haj Hassanin recently moved to Dearborn from New York where he was the principal of the Tawheed Institute and ran a successful internet company called NetSite Corporation which specializes in e-commerce and e-business. Haj Hassanin currently is the director of Camp Taha, the world's first Muslim-owned camp located in Columbiaville, Michigan. Haj Hassanin Rajabali came to settle in the U.S. in 1975 where he immigrated from Tanzania, East Africa. Tonight's lecture will be on the dangers of envy and jealousy and the importance of sugar and contentment. There will be a question and answer session following the lecture, so please stay seated and we'll be having volunteers handing out papers as well as the mic will be going around. We'll be serving refreshments after the question and answer session. On this note, I'd like to welcome Haj Hassanin Rajabali. Please recite a loud salawat to welcome him to the podium. opportunity to represent him on this earth for you know Allah created us to be his representatives now you might ask why is Allah in need of representation it's not really that he's in need of representation but that he has endowed us with so many mercies that it warrants that we represent him due to his mercy and therefore Allah has placed us on this temporal earth as you know this earth is very temporary it's not where we were created for. We were not created for this earth. This earth is certainly not a place for our aspirations to have eternal bliss. 
For this world is a world of contradiction. It's a world of uncertainty. It's, we call it in English, a precarious world. It's a world where you think you're standing firm, but that ground can give any moment. It is a world in which we cannot gauge when we're going to die. We can be healthy, we can do our best to keep a healthy lifestyle, but we never know when death will reach us. We could be as healthy as possible, as careful as possible. All it takes is an object flying towards your direction that could just completely destroy us. It's a world in which there is much fear and um, hopelessness sometimes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created that. In fact, Allah in the Quran says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ We made mankind in a state of trepidation. Trepidation meaning that no matter how much wealth we acquire, no matter how much popularity we have, no matter how much power we acquire, there's always uncertainty. You could be a king and you'll die. And all it takes is somebody to come and get rid of you, or in your bed, while sleeping, you're gone. And Allah guarantees death. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ الْمَوْتِ Every soul shall taste death. So we know for certain this world is not why we were created. Because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too merciful to create us here. He is too merciful to have put us on this earth for us to exist only on this earth. It's impossible. He is too just to have allowed so much injustice to be prevalent. He is too kind to have allowed such unkindness on earth. He is too giving to allow such stinginess to exist on this earth, and so on and so forth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore has not created us for this world. We know that. It's too logical, too obvious. So what is our objective on this earth? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us on this earth simply to test our deeds. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا To test you. Which of you is best in deeds? So we know logically, even if we remove the religion argument, we know logically that for us to consider each other with dignity and respect, it has to come from a moral front. It's not about money, it's not about looks, it's not about strength, it's about how good you are and how good I am. If I am just, if I am kind, if I am honest, if I am humble, if I am giving, if I am forgiving, then these qualities are naturally in us that we love to hear them. And we love to meet a brother and a sister like that. So there's a brother who's kind, loving, giving, forgiving, generous, honest. You say, I want to meet this brother. Why wouldn't you want to meet such a brother? Because that's, a, that's an attractive quality to have. That's a magnetic quality to have. So Allah has put us on this earth as a trial. And one of the things He has given us is the power of insecurity. And on the flip side is the power of security. You ever notice why people want to acquire a lot of wealth, even if they don't know what to do with it? It's because they want security. You say, all your life you cannot use this money, you have a billion dollars. You know, if you have a billion dollars and you spend a thousand dollars every minute, you can't get rid of it. If you're like 20 years of age and you have a billion dollars, every minute you give a thousand dollars, for the rest of your life you can't get rid of your billion dollars. That's how much a billion dollars is. That's a lot of money. But yeah, we want two billion, three billion, twenty billion. It's endless. Why do we want it? It's because there's an innate desire to be secure. That the more I have, the more secure I'll become. The more I have, the more powerful I'll become. The more I have, the more people will recognize me as number one. Because we love to be number one. Even in the sports field, you know. When a person is very good in a sport, we are not satisfied unless you can convince me you're number one, not number two. You know, number one and number two are the same in principle. Up to number ten, maybe they're all the same. But no, you have to be number one. If you're not number one, you're not complete. So what happens then is that this insecurity level is innate in us. And Allah has built it primarily for us to recognize that while we're being tested on this earth, 
It's actually this phone that's ringing on me. <laughs> if you can shut this off, please. Uh, it's this cell phone that's ringing here, please. If we can understand that this uncertainty and insecurity is actually a very good thing. When we have insecurity and uncertainty, it's a very good thing. Because it's a power of weakness. Insecurity is innately weak in us. It's a weakness. So we're all trying to strengthen that weakness by becoming certain. And there's an irony in the human race. That actually there are two ways that a person can take to become certain and at least feel that we're certain. One is the material way and the other is the spiritual way. And classically, the human race prefers the material way because it's tangible. I have it in my hand. I can expend it. And it's visible. And it works immediately. And the many people know I'm rich and I can you know, dish out a ton of money because, wow, you're smart, you're powerful. This is the guy to be with. He gets his way. Police stops him, he slips him a hundred dollar bill, he walks away. Ah, that's power. No one can mess with you, you know. You can hire your gangs and beat them up. You got money. So, what happens is that we feel that that's where the security lies, wealth. Now, what happens in this acquisition of wealth, which is the wrong way to have security, by the way, is that we start also, while we're looking for security, the level of our security is dependent on other people's security. So, for example, if I am the smartest kid on the block because I know the alphabets, then I'm more secure than the one who doesn't know the alphabets. Because if the whole community is illiterate, and if I know the alphabets, I'm the most secure person in the town because I know the alphabets. But notice it's relative to the security of the community. The more security is needed, the more comparisons we need. This is where all problems start. We start comparing with each other in this race of securities. And as a result, we develop hatred and jealousy for each other, hasad. When you are running towards a secure ground and somebody else is already there, we don't like it. Because then typically the implication is that you have it and I don't. Because it's material, it's a comparative. So all of us, you will notice, when someone else has got it, like if somebody is very good looking, we love to admire that person, but deep down we wish we looked like that. Right? Because it's nice to have it. If you have a child that's very good looking, you say, oh, I wish mine was like that. You go to someone's house, you've got a gigantic palace, you say, oh, I wish mine was like this. We all want it, we covet other people's acquisitions, it's human nature. When someone is very smart, you say, oh, I wish I was that smart. And especially when someone is praising someone else, like, oh, did you see that? Look, he's amazing. Now, either you join the band and say, yeah, he's amazing, or you start feeling jealous. Just the way it works with, with the world. This hasad is the most dangerous thing you and I can possess. What's beautiful is that Allah has created this system to check us whether or not we submit to Allah. Because a person who is jealous is really a person who has no faith in Allah. Because Allah says, when you have faith in me, you can't be jealous. Because I own that other person that you are very admiring of. And I gave that person that ability. And if you join me and you submit to me, maybe I'll give it to you too. And even if I don't, it's nice to own your Lord in your heart because you know now your Lord owns everything. So really, we own everything. But we don't want it. Our Iman is usually very shallow at that stage. And there's the greatest joy in life is when you submit to Allah knowing that that beautiful person is Allah's creation. Then there's something very satisfying in it. So when I, I've learned in my life, when I was a child, I used to feel like, oh, how come I don't have it? And I said, this is a perpetual problem for the rest of my life, because I'm going to keep seeing people having good things. When am I ever going to be satisfied? Do I have to constantly have it, otherwise I'm not satisfied? Does my bank account have to be bigger than everybody else's to be satisfied? Right? What I realized is that when you submit to Allah, and when you see somebody very beautiful, 
you learn the way our prophets in Ahl al-Bayt used to say, فَتَبَارَكُ أَحْسَنَ الْخَالِقِينَ When you see a very beautiful person, first thing you should say, فَتَبَارَكُ أَحْسَنَ الْخَالِقِينَ Blessed be Allah, see, تَبَارَكُ Right? The honor is to Allah. What a beautiful creator he is. Whenever you see something beautiful, فَتَبَارَكُ الْأَحْسَنَ what, what are you doing now? You are lining up with the owner, and Allah says, good, you killed the jealousy. You gave credit where it's due. Now you know you and I can never be better than Allah. It's innate. And you will know deep down, I have to submit to Allah. But when you give credit to Allah, there's no competition anymore. You become an owner. <laughs> but sadly, we just don't know how to do it. And now we're always keeping up with the Joneses. He's God, a Mercedes 500, I need a 501. If I don't have a number bigger than his, a millimeter larger than his car, I'm just not satisfied. This takathur, Allah says, al-hakum al-takathur hatta zurtumul maqabir, that abundance will divert you, be careful. There is no tranquility in such races. Rather, when you see a very smart person, say, subhanallah, I'm so happy that this, there is a smart person. And you know where the biggest smile should come? If I see a human being who's smart, it's subhanAllah, that's amazing. But the greatest subhanAllah is when a Muslim has it. When I see a beautiful Muslim, when I see a rich Muslim, when I see a smart Muslim, I'm even happier. <coughs> not that when a Christian is beautiful or smart, I'm not happy, but I'm happier. Because that's a submissive Muslim. That's a Muslim who's holding the title of God on this earth. And if that person is handsome, I'm even happier. Because now you're representing Allah even more. What happens then is the jealousy goes out the window. So Allah in the Quran, in Surah Al-Nisa, verse 54, Allah says, أَمْ يَحْسُدُونَ النَّاسَ عَلَى مَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ do they envy the people for what Allah has given them out of His grace? Meaning Allah, Allah min fadli. Allah gives it to them. Allah said, do you envy that? Are you envious? Are you jealous? Allah says, but indeed we have given Ibrahim's children, to Ibrahim's children, the book and wisdom. And we gave them a great kingdom, mulkan azim. Notice Sulaiman, was the son of Ibrahim. And he was the wealthiest man in the history of the human race. No man was richer than Sulaiman. Yusuf السلام, was the grandson of Ibrahim, the handsomest human being in the Quran. So handsome that women did not think he's human. Hmm? He says, Malakun Kareem. This is not a human being, this is an angel. That's how handsome Yusuf was. Allah says, We gave it to them. Mulkan Adima, strength, power, wisdom, the Holy Prophet's wisdom, hikmah, the hikmah that the Holy Prophet had, no human being in history has been able to exemplify his wisdom. Look at Ahl al Bayt, Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wa salam. The wisdom of Imam Ali alayhi salam, the, the strength in Iman of Imam Ali alayhi salam and the prowess to fight on a battlefield, second to none. His sword would move so fast, people didn't know where it struck them. That's how swift he was. Didn't care, wasn't afraid of anybody. That's a gift of God. Allah says, I gave it to them. Mulkan Adima. Look at the women, the honor of our women, you know. Take the mother of uh, Isa, Isa. Maryam. Take Isa's grandmother, Hannah. But she's so pious, she promises whatever is in the womb, she will deliver it for Allah. Allah says, look how I gave it to them. These are all children of Ibrahim. Allah says, are you jealous of them? <laughs> you take Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, alayhi, such handsome youth. The Holy Prophet said, Al-Hassan wal Hussein, Sayyidi, Shababi Ahlul Jannah. They are the leaders of the youth in paradise. That's a great honor, to be leaders of the youth in paradise. By the way, only youth would be in paradise. So they are the leaders of all. Allah. Some of you are thinking, what about us old people? 
No, no, everybody, including the old one, will enter paradise young, so don't worry. Uh, no one will be old in paradise. Uh, you find that that leadership is a great honor to be given imamat. You know, imamat is such a high position after prophethood. To be the guardians of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be the gate to the city of knowledge. Prophet says, Ana Madinatul ilmu aliyun babuha. Ali is the gate to the city of knowledge. Woman arad al Madina, whoever desires the city. Babi, I mean, come through the gate. Meaning that take the gate to come to me. That's a great honor. You take the women of Zainab alayhi take Fatima the Zahra Samulai, the most honored individual in the, among the female, most honored is Fatima the Zahra Samulai alayhi salawat Now, when you and I examine such people in their time, imagine you see Imam Ali next to you, same age as you growing up, and the Prophet keeps looking at this one, and the Prophet keeps loving this one, and the Prophet keeps whispering things to this one, and the Prophet keeps taking him as his confidant. You and I would probably be jealous too. I'd say, how come I'm not special? Well, Allah has chosen him. <laughs> so Allah is saying, no, no, you are special. But your specialty and specialness will reach its peak when you recognize who I choose. So don't say to Allah, listen, how come you didn't choose me? What's wrong with me? Now it's like Iblis saying to God, why are you asking me to bow to Adam? I can bow better to you. Allah says, when I decree a matter, don't challenge me. If you do, then you're not submitting to me. And that's the problem of jealousy. Karbala took place for ethical reasons. There was a fight between evil and good. 100%. But that's part of the equation. The equation in itself has it that the good ones were so good that they could not avoid but being jealous. Why? Because it brought out their innate, inherent insecurities. So Yazid and Muawiyah were so insecure that he didn't know what else to do. Besides acquire wealth, rob it, steal it, cheat, kill this is what Muawiyah was a master of. Muawiyah was an expert in killing. He was a killing machine. He used to, he used to torture people in public. It wasn't a secret. All historians have written this. Yazid, as we know, was, a, was an expert in killing. He was a killing machine. Why? Insecure. Extremely insecure. Could not, didn't know what to do. He had to build gigantic palaces. They say when Yazid and Muawiyah would walk, as you know, this palace had seven gates. Historians have noted that to reach his inner circle, you had to go through seven doors. How insecure they were. That the first door is very opulent, like a palace. The next gate, bare, nothing in it. Another one, sort of in between. Another one, opulent, you know, full of you know, marble and very, very fancy. Why did he do that? And every wall had holes in it where soldiers and guards would look through the holes to see who's crossing this hallway to enter the palace. And they knew that whoever was not familiar with the palace would be surprised why it's barren. And they'd know that the minute you're surprised, they know you're a stranger and they'll come after you. That's the level of insecurity Yazid and Muawiyah had. To that level, that when they would walk, they were so insecure, but to be pompous and show off, they would have a group of youth who would hold the bakhur, you know bakhur, where they put some incense, and they would incense the work, okay? they'd all walk, then behind them, the Khalifa would walk, meaning Muawiyah would walk, or Yazid would walk. Why? Because they're so great that the pathway they walk should just be perfumed. Yeah, because he was stinking inside, so he needed outside to look good. Because if you're perfumed inside, why do you need the whole army to drive you, right? You can be smelling good just walking on your own. But I was in Mecca at the Kaaba, and I noticed the same fiasco. Same exact fiasco. I'm standing there, and you get pushed by the soldiers. I said, what's going on? Suddenly I see a little army of kids walking with Bukhur, and there's this stiff-necked prince coming through. 
wanting to go to the Kaaba. He said, uh-oh, it's here again. The Omeyyads are here. <laughs> no difference. And I'm staring. He doesn't look at anybody. Else. He passed right in front of me. He doesn't look at anybody. He's, he's, you know, he's special. Now, part of the problem with insecurity is when we have insecurities, is that we compensate by pretending to be that good. We do compensation. You know, we say when you have an inferiority complex, when you have an inferiority complex, what do you do? You try to tell everybody, my father's very rich, by the way. I just want to let you know. Salam alaikum, how are you? You know, my father's very rich. You know, my father just got this great, you, know, you want to come to my house? I got a big house. It's a beautiful house. Have you ever seen a beautiful house? I have. So, you start saying, <laughs> why are you telling me this? I remember I met once a guy, he says, Salam alaikum, how are you? Mother? Yeah, I've got an engineering degree, I've got a triple black belt. <laughs> That's his interruption. <laughs> Rashid Kaiser says, MashaAllah. I looked at him and said, Wow, you have a serious problem of insecurity. Serious. But if the compound ignorance is when you don't even know you have it, it's become a habit. That insecurity is dangerous because that person is going to kill you. To be, it's almost like the person who's in the water, when you're insecure, what do you do? You're trying to help him, he puts your head in the, in the water. Why does he put your head in the water? Because he wants to come up. Not realizing he's, he's choking you. That's how insecure people are. You know? So that's the reality of the world. So where do we gain the security? You look at on the flip side, Ahlul Bayt. They were simple. Very, very down to earth. Take Salman, the Persian. As you know, Salman was a great companion of the Holy Prophet. Salman, his father was very rich in Persia. Very rich. He was one of the richest aristocrats in Persia. And his father was actually the head of the Zoroastrian, you know, uh, church, I mean, uh, movement. And he was, a, he was a priestly class. So Salman would have inherited a large quantity of wealth and power. Flip it now. Here's a guy who's got it. Exact example of the opposite. That's why our companions and our role models in Islam are so essential. For you and I to understand why Islam is a religion of stability and safety through role models. Salman was a wealthy child. So if you want to talk about security, this child is being raised on a golden, with a golden spoon. He's got it. Doesn't have to go out. Salman says, that fire cannot be my God. Shaitan is whispering to him, Salman, be quiet. You know, you're going to challenge this fire, you're going to lose it all. You've got power. You're the heir apparent to your father. You're going to be a rich man. Isn't that what counts? You can buy anything you want. You can have all your toys. Anything you want. Just be quiet. Don't say the right thing. Shh, be quiet. Look at how Salman says, No, that fire is false. It's not God. The father says, If you don't stop saying this, I'll kill you. Salman says, Kill me. Wow. Look at security here. You've been threatened with death. Now flip it the other way. See the security now. No insecurity at all. That's why Allah says, Ya ahadu in za'amtum annakum nas. O you Jews, you claim to be chosen people of God. in kuntum Then have desire for death. Allah says, Wala yatamannawnahu abadan bima qaddamat aydeen. They will not have this desire because they're liars. Why? Because Allah says they are inherently insecure. Death. You ever seen the battles today between the South and they run. They're such cowards they can't even come eye to eye to meet a Muslim. They do it through drones, you know, and they sit thousands of miles away playing Call of Duty, you know, and they're killing people. Right? Press the button, blast it, blow them up. You don't know what's going on. Because the coward is sitting thousands of miles away. Because the coward can't get in the plane. Coward can't even get in the... Uh, uh, can't even walk in front of the enemy. Allah says, they inherit the cowards. They can't even face you. They'll run. Notice the opposite. A coward, insecure. A little bomb drops, they run. <laughs> oh my God, I'm running. You'll see they run. But believers who are firm check what's going on. We're not looking to be suicidal. We don't want to die. We don't want to get killed. But if it means that's the truth, then let it come. This is how I'm saying it. 
He says, if this religion of my grandfather cannot stand upright, in kana din muhammadin, lam yastaqim. If it cannot stand upright, I'm ready. Bring it on. We'll fight. We're not afraid. See, that's security. That Yazid has got his swords sharpened, and they're looking at you, thousands, tens of thousands circling you. And you're just looking at them and says, no problem, come. You'll butcher me. You will step on my body and crush me. I will not rescind it. That's security. Highest form of security is that. Flip it full of jealousy. So what you find is Salman, as you know, escapes. He was put in prison and then his personal maid loved him much, released him and Salman runs away from his father. Salman enters a monastery and becomes a Christian monk for 10 years. This is, those Christians, by the way, were muahideen. They were saying, La ilaha illallah, Isa Rasulillah. But there was confusion also in this, but Salman joined that group looking for the truth. And he realized, I've reached my limits in Christianity. The answer doesn't lie here. There's something else, somewhere else. And he gets in a caravan, as you know, he's heading towards Medina. He gets taken as a slave. And Salman becomes a slave in Medina for 13 years. While the Prophet is declaring his Islam in Mecca, Salman is in Medina suffering. But Salman is looking. He's not a Muslim yet, in the sense of submission. His Iman, his movement, 100% Islam. If, you, if Salman was to die at that stage, he would be a Muslim. Except he didn't declare it. And Allah does not hold us liable for declaration if our movement is towards him. SubhanAllah. That's the beauty of the deen of Allah. Salman, as you know, meets the Prophet. His name was Ruzbe. And then the Prophet sees him, says, your name is now Salman. Salman changes his name. And Salman becomes the best companion of the Prophet. That the Prophet honored him so much, no companion has been given this accolade. Salman min Ahlul Bayt. Salman is like Ahlul Bayt. No companion in the history has been given that Comparative like Salman. See, like Ahlul Bayt. You find Salman in the Imam Ali's time becomes a governor. He's made governor of Ray. Persia. Now, you know, the Persians at that time when governors and kings used to come, they were very pomp. You know, they had horses and trumpets and they'd do a lot of pomp work because you are supposed to be a big, you know, big uh, uh, person. They're waiting at the gates of the city and they see this one man walking along with his clothes, you know, he's got a bag of clothes. And he sees this pump, he's asking them, what's all this? So we're waiting for the governor. He's supposed to be arriving soon. He looks at him and says, I am the governor. <laughs> they look at him and say, come on, you can't be. You're walking on a, you don't even count a horse, you can't be there. He says, I'm the governor. He said, where's your pomp and glory? He says, I don't need it. I am the governor. SubhanAllah. There is a message in that. <laughs> the Salman is saying, there is such stability. I don't need to show off. I am so secure. I have no jealousy at all. I don't need to show off. I don't need to impress you. I'm already impressed with my Lord. And I'm his servant and I'm ready to die. Can you imagine meeting a person like that? I tell you, I'd never let go of that person. I'd hold on to this person till I die. Because that is the most secure being on earth, as far as I'm concerned. Not my big buildings, not the floor, not the ceiling. This is the most secure person. Now compare Salman to Ahlul Bayt and the Prophets. Even then, you cannot get close. Prophets and Ahlul Bayt are even more secure than them, much more. That's why when I grew up as a teenager, I had insecurities. I had a lot of insecurities. I figured if I have my expensive clothes and my expensive car, I will get security. And the more I bought, the more unhappy I became. The more I showed off, the more I realized how fake it was. And I realized this is an endless pit. How far am I going to go to show off? And why am I showing off? Oh, you need to because it's the only way people will look at you. It's the only way people will smile at you. It's the only way people will think of you as being something great. Don't we just love when someone talks about us in the back? So, oh, yeah, that's a great guy. And eventually you hear that, wow, oh, that's great, I'm being talked about. That's fantastic, people are crazy. It's a great feeling. 
No human being can deny that. But I'm going to do that because I've, I've got a beautiful house. And have you seen his house? He's got the best house in all of North America. I feel so good about it. Right? It's fake. It's not real. That accolade is fake. That guy is the richest man in North America. You think that's an honor? What honor? Because what you have in that honor can leave you in a second. But if you have honor of Iman and you're holding on to honor and dignity and respect, it can never leave you. There is no bankruptcy. Like Imam Ali Alayhi Salam says, when you acquire knowledge, it honors you. And when you share it, it increases your honor. And the knowledge does not deplete, but it multiplies. Whereas wealth, you have to guard it, and when you spend it, it decreases. So Imam says, wealth is important, but don't put all your baskets in that direction. Put it in this direction. Be honorable. Be learned. Be wise. Now you will have security. So now look at our security of our youth. We want to look good. Why? Because there is that beautiful opposite gender that I would love to potentially have. Fantasy. We're all fantasized. Girls fantasize of this most, the Yusuf of the world. The one who's going to come is going to be so handsome, I'll cut my fingers, you know. He says, Hasha lillah, you know. Glory be to God, what a man, oh my God. And he smiles at me, that's it, I'm in paradise. <clears throat> and then the flip side, oh my God, that girl, she likes me. Oh, I've got it. Paradise, I'm, I'm done. Fustu wa Rabbil Kaaba, I succeeded today. <laughs> but that, that desire is so temporal. When I see that in people, they get so happy. And I look at them and say, oh, how naive you are. I say, why? I, I, I got it. You think that's what life is all about? You really think that's it? You are naive. You've got a tunnel vision, brother. You think that's it? That's it all my life. That's what I've been taught. You know? If you get that beautiful one, you got success. I said, no, 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 no. The story starts after you get her or get him. Now what are you going to do with that person? Are you going to nurture a good family? Are you going to bring a lie in the picture? That's when the battle begins. You think you can just find a beautiful girl and just start it? No. It's akhlaq, it's character. So I have noticed that as much as we have fantasies, especially my young brothers and sisters have that very strong desire to be somebody important, and I don't blame them. They're always taking the wrong angles to secure themselves. It's almost like they want to stand firm on quicksand, right? So they rub the quicksand. The more you rub, the deeper you go. You see? That's the world we have today. And what happens then? We become very dissatisfied. We become very unhappy. Now, when that unhappiness, feeling of trepidation, it's like an earthquake. When things are shaking, and there's nothing you can hold on to, it is the worst feeling possible. It's like somebody in the ocean, and the ship is moving, and it's absorbing you, the water is absorbing you, and you don't know what to do, and the waves are hitting you, and you're holding on to something, but the sea is just too powerful. It is the most uncomfortable moment a human being can experience. Or drowning is a very uncomfortable few seconds. Very uncomfortable. So, in the reality of our fantasies, sometimes we feel that way. Hence, we don't know what to do, and there's always a friend ready to offer you something hard. Look, your life's not going well. Come on, try this. It'll give you a nice buzz. It's going to get rid of all your problems in the next few seconds. And the guy says, yeah, i got nothing else to lose. She doesn't like me. See, my friend got her. I got denied that job. See, no one likes me. Ah, give it to me. And that's the end of the story. Right? You're done. Because you become chemically dependent, and that's where the drug abuse starts. It's insecurity that causes this. Security comes with checking yourself. When I was very material in buying things, I felt security, security, security. I never got security. And I was crying and crying. Every time, deep down in my heart, there was a void. I've got an expensive car. I can buy anything I want. I'm not happy. 
I cried. And I remember that dua, the power of dua. I cried in the car and I said, Oh Allah, show me. Because I can't. I'm not doing this right. No matter what I'm doing, I'm not happy. Show me the right path. Is this lifestyle that I'm leading the right one? Although, alhamdulillah, I didn't date girls, but I was always seeking approval of people. That insecurity was bugging me every hour. Every hour. You look in the mirror, you're combing your hair. Is that the right way to comb? Maybe this... That, I remember my friend's hair is better. Oh, how come his hair is so straight? Mine is a little curly. Oh, I need to straighten my hair. He says, always the grass is greener on the other side. No matter what you do. And that insecurity is so dangerous that if we don't manage it, it leads to all kinds of problems in society. My goal in my life, after I got out of that, when I prayed to Allah, I said, oh Allah, show me. Show me how to get out of this. And it took time. I had to come to terms with myself. I realized... It's me that's the problem. I am the one that's causing the problem for myself. It's not the world that's rejecting me. I'm giving the wrong vibes. I am compensating, and it's so obviously fake, no one will look at you. It's fake, it's not real. It's like when we put on a facade, we want to appear like we're really good, but we're not. It's, it's transparent, you can see right through it. And that's how we all are as youth. We grow up through those things. And I decided to reverse that engine and give up all the material things. My car got stolen, alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> and it got stolen, alhamdulillah. So, you know, few, I was just like, it's amazing. I was driving my car, I, I was crying, I you know, was listening to my worldly uh, rhythms. <laughs> and um, I was crying, I said, Allah, this is it. This is my world right here. That's it. What a, what a. Fake can do it. I'm nothing. I'm useless. This is it. I'm so dependent on this thing. I said, Allah, show me. Wake me up. I'm not happy. And the car got stolen. And I remember I was so happy it got stolen. I was happy. It's a hundred and I'm so glad I lost it. And from that time onwards, I had to reverse it. I bought a car that was a used car, you know, nothing fancy. And I loved it. Because when I had my fancy new German car, I'd park it way out there at an angle, you know, so no one should scratch it. <laughs> And then, subhanAllah, just the other day I was in the gym working out and this guy came with his um, Corvette, you know, brand new Corvette. He kept driving around the parking lot. And I'm, I'm running on the treadmill, I'm seeing him, you know, he's driving around, he's driving around, he's driving around. I'm looking at him, what is he doing? <laughs> then after a while, I noticed that he parked way out at the end of the parking lot. And he parked it at an angle. And the funny thing is, he, you know, got out of the car, closed the door. Every 30 seconds he'd look at it, like as if it would disappear. <laughs> Every time I say, look at it, I'm just like, subhanAllah, that's how I was. <laughs> and he came into the gym, and he's looking through the window. And I'm looking at this, subhanAllah, he just came in five minutes ago, he's looking at his car. I said, that car is probably saying, slave, come back. <laughs> come and polish me more, please. I'm thinking, what a foolish mentality. It's a piece of metal. Of course, Corvettes are pieces of uh, fiberglass. But the point is, it's the same thing. I said, I'm so, you know, I'm so intrigued in this. And I'm looking at this guy, I said, wow, that's it. And this is an older man. He was one in his 40s, if not 50s. He said, wow, he hasn't gotten out of it yet. This poor guy hasn't gotten out of it. He's got so many fantasies, and he thinks that machine is going to get it for him. That's why he's worshipping. I said, subhanAllah, I was there. When the car got stolen, I realized, it's not the material world that elevates you. And then, you know, you ask Allah, guide me, show me. You take charge. You control yourselves. I have nothing. He says, oh, you have nothing? He says, no, nothing. Wow, I like you. He said, really? I have nothing. No, 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 you've got something. <laughs> I don't need to check your bank balance. I need to see who you are. I said, that's the problem. The gold is in me, just like you. There is no external quality out there that can elevate you and me except what's already planted in you and me. When Allah commanded, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً Allah SWT said, I'm going to place on earth a khalifa. I always used to ask Allah, why did you ask the angels to bow to us? We are Bani Adam. And Allah said, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمٍ We honored you, Bani Adam. Those who resonated in my heart, 
that Allah is saying to me, you don't need a fancy car. You don't need the external. You need to dig deep in you. The gold is in you. Polish it. Let it shine. The world will come to you like a magnet and it'll stick to you. You don't have to acquire it. It will come to you and you won't want it. Aha. As the Holy Prophet has said in a beautiful hadith, he said, when you run after the world, the world will run away from you. When you run away from the world, the world will come after you. Now, don't we all want the world? Yeah, we do. Then run away from it. Ah, that's how Salman was. He ran away from the world, and the world came after him. That he got such a high honor that he was willing to get killed, not to worship the fire. He got so honored with the Holy Prophet that Allah, that Allah through the Prophet, said, Salman min ahlul bayt. That's the honor of Salman that he becomes a governor, the same governor of the same town that Umar ibn Sa'ad wanted. Isn't that funny? Umar ibn Sa'ad killed the Holy Prophet's house because he was promised governorship of Ray. And yet Salman didn't want it, he got it. And when he got it, he went with his simple garb to govern it. Ibn Sa'ad was dreaming of the pomp and riding on the horses. He never even got to eat the wheat from Ray. See? Imam Hussein tells it, says it. Oh, oh, Ibn Sa'ad, you will not even enter Ray. Neither will you eat the bread from Ray. That's how wrong your promise is going to be. Because the world will run away from you. Because, because Ibn Sa'ad went after the world, the world ran away from him. He never got it till he died. Ibn Sa'ad, as you know, was killed. Yet Salman was running away from the world and the governorship came to him. What lesson are you and I going to take from this? These 12 nights of Muharram, what lesson have we taken? Besides shedding tears, which is very important, crying for the tragedy as proof that we are against oppression, proof that we don't like injustice, and we love the Prophet. When we think of the Prophet, our hearts should feel warm. When we think of Ahlul Bayt, it should feel like a specialty. And I say to you, you want to stabilize security? Think of them. You say, how? Look, they are the best role models. You have problems in life? I have problems in life. We always ask, you know, how come I have this problem? Se security and safety? When it's in your heart, you say, how can I compare me with what Prophet Ibrahim suffered? How can I compare me with Prophet Musa suffering? How can I compare me with Isa suffering? The way these prophets suffered? How can I compare me with Ahlul Bayt? The way they were butchered? The way Imam Musa Qadim for them was in prison for decades. How can I compare me? How can I compare me with Imam Hussein, whose little infant child gets an arrow in its neck? How can I compare me? That's a stability. That's security. That's feeling consoled that yes, if I want to complain, then they have a better complain. And look how honored they are. Allah says, you hold on and be patient. I'll honor you too. See? See how Ahlul Bayt works practically now? That every time there's a problem, don't go to drugs. Don't go to harm. Say, wait, I can do that. But no, there's no honor there. Because if I do that, I'll be found on the ditch, freezing in the, in the, on the highway one day, God forbid. I can't do that. No, but it's fun. He says, no, Ahlul Bayt is too close to me. I am guided. Can't be. You and I have all the potentials in our hearts. You don't have to go outside. When I work with kids, that's all I work with. No external forces. When I talk to them, a child comes to me and says, brother, you know, like when they're playing basketball, for example. You see this, even at camp, you know, some of you, some of the youth here came to our camp. And, you know, when they're at the camp, there's this attitude, everybody wants to show off. You have to, you know, to prove that I'm cool. <laughs> and you see that, and you always watch them from far, you know? You see this kid come out, he's going to play basketball, he's wearing the NBA clothes, you know? Got specialty clothes, everything's color coordinated. <clears throat> it's nice, it's nice, you're, you're confident. But they're coming out, they're the soccer, you know? You feel like they're going to play for the professional football team. You know, got all the gear perfectly, and we're going to walk out. I'm ready. And I look at them and say, that's good, but how much insecurity do you have? And you see that. 
sisters the same thing. They come and you see them. Even at the Islamic centers, you see them. They walk around. You can, you can read the insecurities so quickly, it's amazing. And it's nothing wrong. We all have it. We all have those weaknesses. My job as an older brother is to see how much can I bring out the gold in this child? That incredible light the child has so they can feel secure, so they don't need to do that. And it's a very fine chemistry where you need to deal with them carefully, where you bring it out slowly. Eventually they start to have trust in themselves, not in an arrogant way, but in a very profound way that I am somebody. I said, that's it. Now you put it to action. And see how the world will turn to you and you'll start to become that magnet that the world will look at. You don't have to go outside and get anything. You don't need money. You don't need to wave your bank account. You don't need to show your car. You don't. Just you. Talk sensible. Know how to joke. Know when to sit down. That requires training. It's not easy. Okay? But when there's certainty in the heart, that my God is the one who created me, and I am convinced that God is my security, you start giving off light. Look, a classic 18-year-old growing up in North America is the most insecure being on earth. Honestly, I say from experience, a classic 18-year-old are usually the most insecure. 18-year-olds, you see them. Especially when 16, 17, you ever see them break out you know, the faces break out because the tension levels are too much. The chemistry is adjusting, but there's a lot of anxiety, tremendous anxiety. You know, me growing, growing up at the age that I am, I, I wish I could be a 17-year-old. But I also say, no, the, the knowledge I have now and the experience I have, I'd never trade it for any age. I'd love to be the oldest man on earth, because that's the power of knowledge. But then you want to look young, you know, to have that agility and flexibility, it's kind of a contradiction. Because when you're there, you're ignorant. When you're here, you're wise, but your body's not moving as well. So it's a contradiction. So Allah says, manage both. How? Infuse what you have in that 17-year-old. Give him confidence. Now let's look at an example in Karbala. You take Ali Akbar, the son of Imam Hussein, 18 years of age. Classic example of security. See, when I think of Ali Akbar, I don't just think of him going on the battlefield and you know, dying with a sword, with a, with a uh, spear in his, in his chest. I see him as a confident 18-year-old, deeply rooted in Iman, where his father is telling him, we're going to get butchered. The 18-year-old doesn't find excuses to run away. Doesn't say, mom and dad, goodbye, I'm 18. I'm, I'm an adult, bye, see you. I don't have time for you. Classic Western ideology. I can't wait to be 18 so I can, I can leave the house. I can't wait to be 18 so I can call the cops on you. <laughs> you know? Sickness. This is when you go away from Allah. Where a child picks up the phone and complains about his parents or her parents. In, in, an, in an unjust way, in other words. There is a reason sometimes to call, but in general way, no, it's silly. An 18-year-old boy whose father is saying to him, we're going to get butchered. He said, Baba, are we not in haq? Are we not in the truth? He says, yes, we are. Ali Akbar looks and says, Baba, let's continue till we meet our Lord. How many 18-year-olds do you know that can say that? Put that in the heart. Place him carefully. Not an, not an average person. This is a special seed in my heart. How come? Because that's my security. I want to be 18 when I'm 18. As a child, if you're 18, 17. When I reach 18, can I have that certainty about Yaqwa? And don't let shit on food. You say, no, no, of course not. You're not a husband. You're some half loser that came to Canada. <laughs> say, no. None of us are half losers. None of us are losers. Every child, even a drug addict on the street who's non-Muslim, I don't see them as losers. Guy comes and talks to me. He's got tattoos all over his neck. He's got piercings. He says, how are you doing to me? I look at him and says, that's a golden opportunity. There is gold in this person. What can I do to get him out? What can I do to, to express something of gratitude, to give this individual security 
to feel good for one hour, for one day, or to think of me and say, wow, I talked to you, I remember you, I like you. You made me feel good. That's it. But how do we do it? We're we going to throw money at people? No. Are we going to throw material and business plans? No. Sweet tongue, wisdom, certainty. People read certainty, by the way. When you meet a person, says, you know, it appears you know where you're going. Because I can see you're pretty stable. You're not letting these things get to you. You seem very calm. How do you get that? He says, well, I'm gauging it, and I have my trust in Allah. I may die any time, no problem. Let it happen. If a bullet is going to come, let it come. My imams and prophets have shown me that as long as you're walking on the path of truth, like Ali Akbar said, Baba, we're on truth, aren't we? Let us go. If you and I practice that, trust me, you'll walk on the streets, the people will look at you. You shake hands with, who are you? There's something special about you. I like you. You have something. You're not showing anything. He says, no, no, I like you. I want to hire you. I want to give you the job. But why? I'm not fighting for it. No, no, I trust you. That's how the world will deal with us. Trust me. So I want to conclude. Jealousy is poison. The Prophet said, Al-Hasan fi jasad. Jealousy is like fire. It burns wood. It destroys the jealous person. And Allah elevates the one who's jealous, who we're jealous upon. You'll find whenever we're jealous, Allah will raise the one we're jealous of and lower us. And many times in the families we see, especially among our family, women and men, they'll bicker. You know, we're jealous that, you know, my cousin is rich, he's got money, or my cousin is wiser, or my cousin is smarter, or he's got more success. And then we sit in the family and we talk, we backbite, and we create gossip, and we try to destroy them. Oh, how about weddings? Do you ever notice when a, when a brother gets married to a girl, right? When he gets married, and if that girl is the one I wanted for my son or for myself, I can never forgive the guy. There's a sad story to tell you, the danger of jealousy. I don't want to bring it up by names, but the sister, who is the daughter of that very man who was killed, is in this community, probably here, I don't know. Her father, okay, was stabbed in New York because of jealousy, because of marital issues, that somebody married a cousin that the other cousins didn't like. It became so heated that they cornered this poor brother in New York and stabbed him many times and killed him. You know when? You want to see the irony? On Ashura night. The same Husseinis who cry for Imam Hussein, so-called Husseinis, I don't call them Husseinis, I call them Jahilis, killed him. And the child became an orphan. That's the power of jealousy. It hit me so hard, we traveled to Pakistan to go see the family, because the family was in Pakistan. It, it cut my heart to see the stupidity of a dumb issue. If somebody's marrying somebody and they're so jealous, that they started bickering so much that they couldn't contain themselves. They cornered this father and stabbed him for that reason. Is this, is this Islam? This is an enemy of Allah. And what damage did it cause? The father is gone. Is that fair? You think it's fair for us as Muslims to allow such things to creep in? We say, no, no, we're Shia, we are lovers of Ahmed Bay, it can't happen to us. I'm telling you, it happened among us. That's, and it's not only among us, it happens to all of human beings. It's not to us as Shia, I'm not saying that, or Ahl Bayt followers. It happens to the whole human race. But the worst scenario is after the role models we have, and the examples the Quran gives about who we follow, the last people on earth that should be killing under these conditions should be us. The last people. To me, it's an indicator when I saw that, that Imam Hussein is surface tongue in our tongues. We pretend to cry for Imam Hussein with crocodile tears, thinking, oh, if I cry, maybe God on Judgment Day will open a special gate for me to enter paradise. It's fake. It's false. When we bicker and we do riba and we sit around and gossip against others, we are not the lovers of Imam Hussein. I'm sorry to say that. I don't care if you go and do Latmiya for a thousand hours and you read Quran all day and you pray in Jama'ah on the front line. 
when you and I gossip and have jealousy against others, we don't believe in Allah. Simple. Because the product of that jealousy comes out in the trueness. But when you and I believe in Ahlul Bayt, how can we have such dumb jealousy? Tell me. And this is the story I end tonight as to how jealous that Imam Hussain goes on the battlefield and before he is killed, that he asks them, for what reason are you killing me? They said, we were, we didn't like your father, Ali ibn Abi Talib. The jealousy people had of Amir al-Mu'mineen was so extreme because the Prophet loved him so much, because he was so close to the Prophet, because he obeyed the Prophet 100%. He says, I was like a she-camel, baby camel, that followed the Prophet up the mountain. I never let go of his sight. And it is the Prophet who taught me how to defend on the battlefield. You know, Imam Ali a.s. learned the art of defense. The Prophet taught him. Can you imagine the Holy Prophet teaching him? You would think the Prophet taught him? Yeah. He used to take him up the mountain and show him how to spar. The Prophet did it. Imam Ali a.s. says, the Prophet taught me how to do this. He loved the Prophet so much, people couldn't stand it. Couldn't stand the Banu Hashim, how chosen they were. But the caliphate that came, have the, the notations of famous scholars, even the first few caliphs that came, they said we were jealous of the Banu Hashim. How come God chose them? Prophet who came through them, now Khilafah should also come through them? No, we won't allow it. That's why our Imams suffered. That's why Karbala took place. Because the jealousy was so intense, they made sure that Ahl al-Bayt were not given their right. And Imam mentions that. He says, it's like a bone stuck in my throat that they have taken my right. That's the power of jealousy. So then when you see in history, it culminates in Karbala that when Yazid gets the head of Imam Hussain Alayhi the first thing he does when he looks at it, he's drunk. Jealous, jealous, jealous. Why? Because his grandfathers were in Badr. The pagans were Yazid's grandfathers. And by the way, the Holy Prophet with his own mouth said, Muawiyah and his son are kafirs. They're not believers. How do I know that? Famous hadith of all schools of thought. That the Prophet said, the kafir will kill you, O Abu Dhar. Abu Dhar was asked, who will kill you, O Abu Dhar? The Prophet said, the disbelievers will kill you, O Abu Dhar, and you will see them carrying black flags. They will kill you. And in Safin, Abu Dhar al-Ghafari was killed by Muawiyah. And the Prophet said, disbelievers, kafar, will kill you. And it's true. So Yazid was a kafir, 100% kafir, 100% kafir. But where was his kufr from? When they lost the battle in Badr, when the Prophet defeated them, there was only 313 of them. There was a thousand on the enemy's side. And they were annihilated in terms of battles. They couldn't believe it. Three times the army and the Prophet had a very meager army. They say there was only a few horses. They only had a few shields. They were not even equipped with armament. They did not have the equipment. They did not have the shields and the, and the swords and so on. They did not have it. They were very, very shallow. And even then they defeated Badr. And that established Islam in the month of Ramadan. As you know, 17th uh, of Ramadan, uh, you know, the, the famous event took place. You find that that battle took place, it established Islam. The enemy couldn't forgive that. And who started the battle on the front to defend Islam? Ali ibn Abi Talib with his Hamza and uh, um, okay. You find three of them over there. And Imam Ali was the youngest. They couldn't stand. This young boy is so dedicated. Trust me, if there's one thing that's jealous to us in all our hearts, is when we see a teenager submitting to Allah. When an old man or a woman submits to Allah, it's okay. It's expected you're going to die soon. We say, teenager, what, what are you doing? Praying. Holding on to Allah. You're a fanatic, they call you. Fanatic. What's your problem? You go to the masjid to pray? Come on. We got a world waiting for us out there. The parties, you know? We don't have time. The guy says, no, I'm going to go say my prayer. I'm jealous of you. I'm jealous of you. You started so early. 
at least make a few mistakes, get a few scars, and then repent it for the rest of your life. No. No, you don't want that. I want to be with Allah. I want to die with Allah. This is impossible. We're all scarred. You need to get scarred. I did Allah haram. You must do some haram. And then you do step up. So, you find that's exactly the opposite of how Imam Ali al As a teenager, he stands up. As a nine-year-old boy, he's already defending the Prophet. The Prophet appoints him as his successor when he's nine years of age in the house of Abu Talib. Shouldn't that bring jealousy? Oh my God. And it culminates and culminates and culminates and culminates. It comes to a point where they can't stand Imam Ali al That army that formed Muawiyah. Muawiyah is talking to Ibn Abbas, a famous muhaddith. He says, that friend of yours, that cousin of yours, tell me about him. So he says, he starts praising him. He says, no, 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 don't praise him. Muawiyah. I don't want to hear praises of Ali. It disturbs me. So Ibn Abbas says, so then you don't want me to read the Quran? Because the Quran is his praise. So Muawiyah didn't know what to do. Okay, well, just don't mention his name. Say something. He just couldn't get it. He made it a policy to take all praises of Imam Ali and switch it to the enemies of Ahl Bayt. Change the names, make the enemies. Today, millions of people think that those stories are true, those false hadith, whereas all the qualities were given to Imam Ali. That's the machinery of the Umayyads until today. Go to Syria today and see how many children are being killed. Our Shia. By the way, in Syria, the ones who are getting the biggest price in Zayda Zayna are the Afghani Stanley community. Because the Iraqis have left. Iranians have left. Pakistanis have left. Poor Afghanis, where are they going to go? And they are sitting there waiting. And they're getting butchered. Because the Wahhabi armies, you see, is coming after them. And I know some of them, personally, who were killed. Young boys, 17, 16 year old boys, shot at, beheaded. And their heads were sent back. They said, this is your gift of Eid al-Adha, just because they love Ahmed Bayt. That jealousy hasn't stopped. Millions are being spent now. Look at our Hazara community in Afghanistan. How much punished they have been because they are Ahmed Bayt followers. How much they have suffered under the hands of Taliban. My God, you cannot compare. This animosity of Taliban and Al-Qaeda and these groups, these are enemies of Allah. These are the Umayyads. These are the Khawarij that Imam Ali fought, the Khawarij. These are the ones. The Khawarij used to go and kill Muslims. Imam would get on a horse and go and stop them. And Muawiyah would finance them. Same. The game of Muawiyah financing Khawarij, the ultra zealots who look religious with long beards, shooting people. I see the same happening then as it's happening now. Jealousy, jealousy, jealousy. I say to them, Ali ibn Abi Talib is one of your Rashidun. Even Ahmad ibn Hanbal says, Karram Allahu wajib that may God elevate his face, for he never bowed to an idol. How come you and I have to die because we love him? Jealousy. Are you jealous by what we have given them? Allah says we have given them plenty, and we will give them more. And we will deny you, and you're going to enter hell. So these people were killing in Syria today, for example, killing in Bahrain, because they are Shia, they are lovers of Ahmed Bayt. They, they are the majority. We talk about democracy. What happened to majority rule? Hmm? Because we've got an army there, now we need to suppress the majority? What democracy are we talking about? Right now, Palestine wants its recognition in the United Nations. They don't want to give it to them. What democracy are we talking about? It's all about jealousy for Islam. Because Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, and they can't stand it. Jealousy, brothers and sisters, comes, continues to follow, and they find every reason in the sky to attack. But Allah says, hold firm, don't sell out, and I'll give you victory. And Imam Hussein got victory. Yazid was angry at that man. I took him, I cornered him, slaughtered him, and even then they don't say yes to me. Hajjaj ibn Yusuf did everything. He used to take Sayyid, little Sayyid, children of Imam Ali al They would build these pillars, then he would bury them in between that. He'd take them into basements and bury them with, with soil and kill them. Because if you are Ali, and from the family of Ali ibn Abi Talib, kill them, kill them, kill them. The price our 
our, especially the Shia, the, especially the Prophet's family prayed, they even ran away to Europe. That's how much they were being chased because of jealousy. That there were many Muslims, Shia, Allah was the way, who ran to Europe to hide, to take refuge because they were being sought after by this empire. Has it stopped today? Has it stopped? So what are you and I going to do? Are we going to hide? Are we going to be afraid? No. Never be afraid of them. They all, they call them chicken hawks. You know what chicken hawk is? They're terrified to go to battle, but when battle starts, they scream like hawks. Yeah, I killed him! Yeah, I killed him! So you were chicken to go there. And they sit behind and they press buttons killing people. Chicken hawks, we call them. Chicken hawks! Allah says, don't be afraid of them, they're weak. The way you and I rise is be a good Muslim. Observe the deen and know your stuff. When anybody talks to you, know how to articulate. Knowledge, brothers and sisters. Gain knowledge, talk it the right way. And I conclude, the jealousy, that it culminated finally when Yazid was looking at the head of our blessed Imam on that plate. He was so jealous, but that head was sublime, full of light and nur. It was filled with blood, of course. But I can just imagine that head. So many people died just to look at that. Even as I mentioned, a Roman ambassador, his priestess got killed because he was so in love with the head of the Blessed Imam. He hugged it. Many people used to chase it because it's so honorable. It has given its soul for the love of God. And Yazid took a stick and started hitting the lips and the teeth. That should hurt us. That the dignity and honor <coughs> Allah SWT gave that this man, after butchering him, butchering his family, couldn't satisfy himself, that he takes a stick and hits it. His story says, Zayd ibn Akam sees Ibn Ziyad doing this. He says, shame on you. I saw the Prophet kissing it lip to lip yesterday. Shame on you. Hmm? Anas ibn Malik comes and says, what a resemblance of the Prophet. That face resembles the Prophet in dignity, in honor, in stature. You and I should bury it in our hearts that this jealousy the enemy of Allah carried, I will not carry it. I will reverse it and I will love humanity. And I will teach them. And I will rise for justice and dignity. And I will not allow what the Umayyads did to the human race. أي ملك لبين ينقلب صلاه على محمد وعلى محمد الله الله just a quick announcement there is a BMW with a license plate AYBT262 the lights are on are you having a Q&A session yeah okay Thank you, Hajj Hassani, for that motivational and inspiring lecture. Inshallah, we can all learn from it and apply it to our daily daily lives. We will now start the question and answer portion of the program. There are mics available. Please put your hand up, and a volunteer will, volunteer will bring it to you. We will alternate between the sisters and the brothers. We will also have pens and papers for those who wish to write their question. Please try to keep your questions related to tonight's lecture. <clears throat> if you want to ask a question in the meantime, you're more than welcome to do so. Okay, and what can we do to reach a level of security? Okay, what can you do to increase your faith? That's a very good question. One thing I've noticed in life, we give value to that which we understand the value of. So, for example, if I don't know the value of something, I may overpay it and be cheated. For example, if you're going to go buy a house, 
and you don't know the real estate market in Toronto, then you hire a realtor who knows the values so that you can be guided on what to buy for the proper price. If you're going to sell and trade gold and silver, you get an expert in metals who understands the value so that you make the transition as a fair transition. The problem we have with life is many a times we have not valued life properly. So we are always putting the wrong price on the wrong things, hence our faith is always weak. The best way to gain value is to evaluate the nature of this world. You will notice that this world, no matter how much we possess it, it doesn't have the value you and I think we has. Like my acquisitions, I used to think about that. If I had a billion dollars, I'd still have to store it someplace. I'd have to guard it. I'd have to keep track of it. Yes, I'd be a very wealthy person, and I can dispense it and do what I want to do, but there are many prices that come as a result of that. That now I own a billion dollars worth of goods. What am I going to do with the billion dollars worth of goods? Well, you play with it. I have a house in France, I have a house in you know, Bermuda, whatever. Well, each house is accountable. You have to manage it. You have to take care of it. And I thought about this very rapidly. I said, you know, what a burden. Sure, you can hop on a plane and go, but it's a burden. Even Bill Gates, who was one of the richest men on earth, said, wealth is a burden. I can't handle it. He's worth $40 billion. He gave it away. He's giving it away. He's only leaving a billion for his children, which is still a lot of money. But he's giving away most of it. He said, it's a burden. I can't handle it. That's why Allah says, it's a burden. Can you handle it? Now, when you know that value, and you evaluate that, it, can wealth give me happiness? No. It's a tool that I can use, but it won't give me happiness unless I know how to use it. Suleiman knew how to use it, so he got happiness. But many of us don't know how to use it, because it's corrosive if we don't know how to use it. When you evaluate all these things, you see, friends, for example, we have loyalty to friends. We have people who do haram things, but because my friend has asked me to do it, I feel like I have to do it because I am loyal to my friend. In fact, most youth have problems for this reason. They have loyalty with their friends. And that loyalty is a priceless loyalty. That if your friend says, you and I, we're going to do this, you don't want to hurt your friend, so you're going to do it. Because of loyalty. We feel bad. What will my friend think of me? I remember growing up, this was my biggest problem. Loyalty to my friends. And if I don't have good friends, you see, I will fall into the, the ditch. So when you evaluate that my friend's loyalty is up to this much only, where there's a red line, I'm not going to cross it. There's a red line to money. There's a red line to my ego. There's a red line to my family. There's a red line to my, to my uh, education. If you know where to place all these, your Iman will become very strong. And you'll notice that no matter how much red lines you place, you'll always see that they're all short. They're all run short. The only one that brings total security is to hold on to the role of Allah. Hold on to the rope of Allah. That is the greatest security. How? How do you know that? He says, well, no matter how and what I possess, I can drop dead. I can have enemies. But if I have faith, even if I'm alone, even if everything in the world is taken away from me, I'm still secure because I have evaluated that everything will vanish. Allah says, كل من عليها فان ويبقى وجه ربك ذو الجلال والإكرام Everything will perish. So Allah says, did you evaluate that? Now come to me that way. Now Allah will give you a million dollars. You'll know what to do with it. Allah will give you a beautiful child, beautiful family. You'll know what to do with it. Allah will give you beauty. You'll know what to do with it. Allah will give you a beautiful house. You'll know what to do. You won't abuse it because you know where the gauging line is. You'll never show off. Allah will give you the most expensive car. You'll not. You, you, it will be nothing. Allah will invite you to homes of the richest people. And you look at them, you won't be intrigued. It's not for sale. You won't be sold. They'll throw money at you. You won't take it. You'll only take it for Allah. Otherwise, you won't take it. Somebody throws money at you, says, take it. I want you to use it. She says, no, I don't want it. Why not? I'm giving it to you. She says, no. You want me to use it for Allah, I'll use it. But for me, I don't want it. 
Why not? Don't you have any desires? Sure I do. I don't need you to give me my desires. My Lord gives it to me. I don't want any string wrapped around my neck with you. I don't want that. I want my own living. So no one can point a finger at me. That's evaluating. Iman, sister. That's Iman. Now when you're with your friends, let's say you go to, I give, when I was here the last time speaking at this center, some sisters came to me and said, we have a big problem in our cultural weddings. You know, weddings violate a lot of principles of Islam. And it's my cousin, and if I don't go, you know, the gossip starts, and then we now have families that we're going to fight, and this one doesn't like that one, and I can't even say salam to this one. You know the story. Or hijab is another one, or many reasons. Oh, I have to go. So there's a lot of satanic things happening, I gotta go. What do I do? So there's a fine line, of course. Sometimes if you have to, okay, but be very discreet about it. But isn't it great when you know that you don't come to those weddings? And they don't invite you. Oh, those are the best. But there are people in our communities, if you don't invite me, I'll kill myself. <laughs> you didn't invite me to your wedding? All my life I have that dress that I want to wear. You didn't give me the chance to display it? That's our dream. Right? One month in advance we go to the beauty parlors and get ourselves ready. It's a wedding. That's the day we're going to show off like peacocks. We're going to walk around showing our feathers. You're so excited. So that's what life is about, you know? Get dressed and look good and then put it in the closet and start another one. Get dressed, put it in the closet and start another one. What a cycle, what a dumb cycle. <laughs> when people are dying, my life is so short, Mother Kulmot is waiting for me at the end of the road and I'm worrying about these things? I don't think so, I don't think I have time for that. That's the difference between how we see life. Now, they were waiting like this, loyalty. I said, what choice do I make? I said, you know, well, I need to go. If it really bothers you, say to the family, look, I'll come. When the nikah is taking place in the masjid, I'll come, we'll join. But that reception, thank you very much. Why do you have to show up? Oh, loyalty. I say, okay, if it's loyalty, when I come, I don't like these kinds of gatherings which are un-Islamic. I don't want my children to learn how weddings should take place this way. I don't want it. It's like a TV show, when there is some bad event on the TV. I don't want my daughter to learn this act. I don't want my daughter to know this is what humans do. I will teach her when she's ready to learn, but I don't want my Can you call me an extremist? Can you say that I am close-minded? No, I'm careful. If you don't like it, the world is vast. Go get another friend. Oh, brother, you'll be all alone, you know? Nobody will call you. I said, good. Aren't you scared that you need friends? I said, hey, there's seven billion of them waiting. It's funny how the world is just eager to have friends. And we're worried about losing one. Let's not fool ourselves. That principle is loyalty. Stick with it and Iman will get strong. People will admire you. And you know when you honor will be the greatest in that same family? When someone dies. See, when there's a marriage, they don't call you. But when someone dies, you're the first person to be called. You know what? Make dua, please. <laughs> Can you please read Fatiha for me, please? So why me? Brother, you know, you're such a pious brother. You didn't come to my wedding, you know, which I never forgive you for. But please read his Fatiha, because inshallah, your Fatiha will take it straight to paradise. It's, it's, a, it's the best moment in Insan's character is at the time of the funeral. See who looks at who. Brother, can you read Yasin, please? So why? You can read it. No, no, you. You're, you're Yasin. Angels are waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I love those moments. It's subhanAllah. Glory and honor. Sadly, it has to come at the time of death. There are a few questions over here. A few here. questions? Yeah. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us through different trials, such as health, children, and wealth. If an individual feels like he or she is being tested from all of the above, is he or she being punished? If not, then how can we identify between punishment and test and trial? Good point. Allah SWT doesn't punish us the way we think it is. Never say that, please. When a child is born sick, or the child has, for example, Down syndrome, or a community, an earthquake takes place, yeah, God is punishing them. They were all bad. That's why the earthquake took place. Don't say that. That's not true. This is false. Allah does not punish us the way we think He does. It's wrong. It is definitely a trial. Definitely. Everything in life is a trial. Nothing can come outside of the trial. But it's not a punishment. When does punishment come? 
when we do dumb things. Now, how does that happen? There is a natural system. For example, here's a punishment. I decided to lie. I had an option of speaking the truth, but I said, no, I'm going to lie. So I lied. I didn't ask for forgiveness. I lied again, and I lied again, and I lied again. Eventually, my lies unraveled like a house of cards, and I became very um, uh, insulted, and I lost my dignity and honor. And the community or whatever, the system, let's say, put this person in jail, or this person lost all their dignity and wealth. That is a punishment. Why? Because the natural system When you and I violate Allah's core principles of goodness, that's punishment. For example, I woke up in the morning, you know, God gave me $10,000. And I said, you know what, I'm going to get rich real fast. So I'm going to go to the dartboard, you know, throw a dart. Okay, it's in the center. Okay, let's just buy this stock. So you decide to buy all the stock. And before you know it, you're buying, 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 and you lost all the money. Now you're bankrupt. That's a punishment. Because you did dumb things. But if you worked very hard, you were very strategic, and you managed everything possible in the best of ways, and you lost it all, it's not a punishment. It's a good lesson. Even the first one is a lesson, but that lesson was a foolish one. Where you learned it, and if you ever do this again, you're a fool. But if you do the second one, where you're careful, but now you've learned how not to invest in the wrong ones, and if you learn that, then it's a great lesson. But at the end of the day, it's a very fine lining, is what we call punishment. I deserve it. Or for example, I saw a person, and I started to laugh at it. I said, you, I'm so much better than you are. You know, I, I was very arrogant and condescending. And I put this person down. And in, in a short time, you know, uh, my, my arrogance showed off by me doing the dumbest thing, and everybody started laughing at me. I could say, okay, that's a punishment. You're arrogant? Here it is, it came smacking at you. That's a punishment. But that's a natural system of Allah's punishment. Everything else is a trial. Punishment by Allah in the Quran was before the Messenger of Allah. According to our fuqaha and ulama, they say that when the Holy Prophet was born, Allah delayed all those punishments that people disobeyed Allah. All till the day of judgment, no more. Rahmatul alamin. God, the Prophet is such a rahmah that Allah delayed and postponed all the punishment. And the punishments that came before, like Qamalud, uh, you know, the Thamud, those were lessons for us to take, but it's not the norm of God's system. Those were lessons. Can you explain about a person who is religious but very abusive and angry all the time and won't admit he is wrong? Any person who's abusive does not understand the true nature of deen. Deen, religion means to be submissive to Allah with kindness. They are violating the Quran. The Quran does not allow harshness in an attitude. So anybody who does that is violating the core principles of Islam. Now, a person who's violating, there are ways to stop that by making the person aware. Sometimes if they don't even realize they're harsh. Sometimes they think that's how they should be. So bring, pray to Allah, bring a third person in the conversation sometimes, and let the person, make that person aware. Awareness is extremely important. When a person becomes aware of their own harshness and their goodness, this in itself is a solution. So a religious person who's harsh is not really a submissive person. A submissive person is got khushu. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتٍ خَاشِعٌ the one who has khushu, calm, they know how to talk. Our prophets and imams were never harsh to anyone. Never, ever. There was a man who comes and he is now very harsh to Imam Hussain al -Islam. Very harsh. The imam is sitting on his horse. He holds the, the, the reins of the horse. And he's talking to the imam. And he's very harsh to our, our third imam. And he's really being, just venting on the imam. The imam gets off the horse. You know, you think you get off, what are you going to do? You're going to challenge the guy. He says, you look tired, come home, let's have lunch, relax, we'll continue to talk, and then you can vent more. The man was stumped, he was crying. He says, I'm harsh, you reply me with such kindness. He said, I'm sure there's a reason for your harshness. There's another story of a man who used to always curse Imam Jafar Sadiq Whenever he would see Imam Jafar Sadiq he would curse him. 
Cursing him in the sense he would he would say bad things to Imam. Imam would never say anything. One day, you know, Imam says, I want to show you a lesson. He says to the companions, he says, I'll teach you a lesson. Come. So Imam takes money in a, in a bag, you know, gold. He says, come. And he goes to this very man's house. As the Imam is entering his um, gate to come to his house, the man sees the Imam coming and he's kind of thinking that maybe the Imam is coming to hit him, you know, because he's been venting so much on the Imam. Maybe the Imam now is going to come and strike him. And the Imam walks carefully towards him and uh, says, uh, I'd like to talk to you. Can you imagine having the guts to do that? Just think about it. Somebody's always bashing you. Imagine having the guts to go to that. It's very tough. It requires a lot of stability. It requires a lot of Iman. Imam walks to the man. He says, I've come to buy your land. I want to buy your land. How much do you want? So the man gives him a, a price. The imam doubles it. He says, double what you ask for. Gives it to him. The man smiles. He says, God knows where to put his representatives. I was nice to the imam. The imam walks away. He says, you know why he was angry? He knew I was the imam. And his land was not bringing any fruits. He was angry with Allah. So he threw it on me. I solved this problem. See? So sometimes a person's anger doesn't mean it's on you. It could be something else that's venting at you. Just like the messenger of Allah. There was a Jewish woman who hated the Prophet. And every time the Prophet would walk by the city, she would throw garbage at him. She would take trash and she'd throw it at him. And the Prophet would cover himself, never complain. One day, as you know, the trash wasn't being thrown on his head. He inquired, found out the lady is sick. How many of us would have the guts to go knock on the door of such a woman? And go and say, excuse me, I didn't get the trash on my head today. He didn't say that, but he goes, he asks, he says, I've come to visit you. The woman began to cry, she became a Muslim. Because, she says, with that kindness, how can I not follow you? I tell you, they say, courtesy costs nothing. It buys everything. I think one of the questions is on the sister side. Uh, um, I'm taking a psychology course, and it's uh, basically talking about um, jealousy. And uh, it has different models, and it's using the, our biological systems and saying that uh, we are innate in our... Um, our jealousy because it creates social bonds and that um, sometimes it actually, jealousy pretty much um, makes us succeed in life as well because if you see someone, you know, for example, studying harder, you will actually, that jealousy makes you study even more harder, so in that terms, um, that's how you succeed. Um, my sociology class basically says that jealousy is, always, is also incorporated in our culture. So we have all of these um, things that are being reinforced constantly within us. Um, however, at the same time, according to what you're preaching, it's violating the principles of Islam. Um, how do you overcome these kind of things? Okay, where very good point. The word jealousy is inherently negative. The implication is, I should succeed and you should fail. That's the real definition of jealousy. Hasad. Okay. Uh, and Allah even says, you know, And in this ayah, Hasid uh, Hasad. Okay, protect me from the jealous one against me. Because the intent, there are two kinds. What you're saying in psychological terms, we use that word in English called envy. When I'm envious, it's not jealousy, envy. Okay? Envy means that I admire you and I want it too. That's where we comp have competition. Jealousy is, I want it and I don't want you to have it. You must not have it. And if I don't have it, you must not have it either. So if anyone's going to have it, I should have it. But you definitely should not have it. That's jealousy. That's deadly. That is haram in Islam. But when we're envious, but we say, wow, I admire that. But even me personally, I don't like the word envy. I think it's, it's not complete, even the term envy. I think it should be, if you, there's envy, then it should be for myself. That shame on me for not having it, for I can have it. Put it on you, don't put it on the person. 
When you see somebody having it, like when you see a child reading Quran, don't say, oh, he has it. That's good. It's very good. But say to yourself, shame on me, I don't have it. Shame on me, I should have it. Now I have redirected my energy to me. I'm pointing a finger at me, not at anyone else. The external world, which you're saying, we're social, and we're very gregarious beings, and we're very impacted by our surrounding, and I agree with that. And this desire to compete with each other is an innate thing. I agree with it totally. That we are social beings that are constantly competing with each other, which is very healthy. The Quran even says, compete with each other for doing good. You know, Quran says, Tawasso bil Tawasso Tawasso means, enjoin on each other, push it. Hey, why don't you do it? Come on, let's do it. Pushing, pushing. Yes, we're social beings and we feed off each other. So that's very good. But jealousy, by Quranic terms, is very bad. Look what Allah says, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوا مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعَدَكُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ Do not covet that which Allah has made some of you to excel others. This is in the Quran. Men shall have the benefit of what they earn, and women shall have the benefit of what they earn. And ask Allah of His grace, surely Allah knows all things. So Allah said, don't covet, ask me, I'll give it to you. Ad'uni astajib lakum, I'll give it to you. Believe me, you want it, you will get it, for sure. And if you don't get it, no, it wasn't good for you. Quran says, Asa an takraw shay'an, wa huwa khayrun lakum. Wa asa an tuhibbu shay'an, wa huwa sharrun lakum. So Allah says, be grateful with what you get and don't get. That if you and I make the desire to want it and we don't get it, then there's a reason behind it. But if we haven't asked for it, don't complain that you didn't get it. Allah says, ask for it. Maybe I'll give it to you. So what is the best though in all of this is to be satisfied with what Allah gives us. Imam Ali al says, the greatest wealth a human being possesses is satisfaction. When you and I are satisfied, you're not going to go anywhere. It's a beautiful reality. I'm satisfied. That's why Imam Hussein in Kabbalah says, Ridham bi qada. I am satisfied by your decree. Children are being butchered. His family is being butchered. His women are going to be taken slaves. I am satisfied. Imam says, look, do we covet that? Yes, we should covet. You know, you know should we covet in a negative way? No. Should I look at the Imam and say, wow, I want to be like you. I admire you. Allah says, that's why I sent them. Should I be jealous of them? No. Should I be envious of them? No. No envy. No. The best prayer is, when you see somebody having it, he is the best prayer. Oh Allah, you gave this person this beautiful face, and this beautiful mind, and this beautiful heart. Oh Allah, for your love, give them more. And give me more too. Now that is a balanced equation. And Allah loves that. Now I'm satisfied. I'm not jealous. I don't envy. I don't destroy. I smile. I hug. You know how many diseases I just got rid of just by saying that? When someone is jealous, they can nazar or evil eye you. How do you protect yourself from this? Ask Allah to protect you. Evil eye, by the way, cannot be like when I look at you with my evil eye. You know, <laughs> suddenly your heart blows up. You know. <laughs> Start bleeding. <laughs> There's no such thing, please. There's no such power with the evil eye. You're like, oh my God, he's looking at me. I know my child is going to die now. There's no such thing. Evil eye, according to our, our scholars, according to the Quran, is the power of suggestion. So she says, you know, that person is very jealous of you. He doesn't like you. Really? She says, he's praying that you die. Oh my God, really? I'm going to die? Then you start dying. Yeah, you start dying. Yeah. She says, oh my God, that evil eye got me. It's power of suggestion. If I suggest that you're going to die and you really start believing me, you will die. You know, if I keep saying you're sick, you're sick, you're sick. You start becoming sick. Okay? It's psychosomatically induced. I, I'm believing it, I'm going to induce it. So be careful with that. Evil eye, people have that. In public, people have that. It does. Hold on to the rope of Allah and say, Allah, you're my protector. And they say the best. Ayat to read in the Quran to protect from the evil eyes, Ayat al Kursi. Ayat al Kursi is unbelievable. Read the four calls. You know, read the four calls. The Holy Prophet says if you read Ikhlas seven times when you leave your house, you will come back the same way you left. Guaranteed. 
Nothing will happen to you. Ikhlas. Like, unless it's a decree, you should be satisfied that if Allah you want, it is my time to leave, I will leave. But Allah let me leave dignified. So the way you get rid of this evil eye is this. Another way to get rid of evil eye, charity. Charity, help orphans, help the poor. Give. You got five dollars? Give a dollar. Somebody who needs it. There's always somebody else. Yesterday I was watching TV and no, no, I was watching on the internet and I was they were showing these um, very, very poor children. In, in, in Afghanistan, for example, a good example. There was an Afghan family and the you know, husband is on the streets every day looking to make his ends meet. And the daughter has got cancer, blood cancer. You know, this came on press TV and it was on this one hour show. And my heart was breaking. God, I wish I could just jump there and, and just throw that money at this person. So here, I'll take care of it. But you can't. You cry. It hurts you. You feel the pain. Allah says, feel that pain. You may not reach that one, but you reach someone else. Give charity. Many balas will go out of you. A person comes and asks the Holy Prophet, how can I prevent a tragic death? He said, give charity. Keep giving charity. Charity brings harmony in your house. It takes the bala away from you. And you put a smile on somebody else's face. Isn't that the greatest form of charity? You make somebody feel good. So let's be charitable all the time. Think in our lives, how can I be charitable with my tongue, with my heart, with my hands, with my money? If you keep thinking this way, you will be the happiest person. That's, we have been hardwired, by the way. I'm telling you, we have been hardwired that when we give charity, we become happy. That's been studied. That's been shown in scientific terms. Humans who work to give charity are the happiest people in the world. In this Toronto community, we have brothers. You know, our brother Muhammad, for example, in his group. I know some of the brothers and sisters who get together and you go every, you know, to the homeless on the streets and you feed them. I know JCC does the cooking and it takes them a whole day and then the kids go and they give. And Muhammad was telling me that one sister who came with them, you know, her life was completely flipped at 180 when she saw the experience. She says, wow, I never knew there's such poverty. I'm living comfortably, I have money, I live in a beautiful house. Now I think every day what I can do for more homeless people, how I can help one poor person. You know what happens to that person? They become happier. That while they're pursuing their wealth, their vision changes. It's no longer to amass the wealth. It's no longer to show the Joneses how rich I am. It's to use it for Allah so that I can become happier. If you do that, believe me, our bala and our problems will go away. Even this bad evil eye will not come to us. It won't come to us, guaranteed. There's a question on the men's side. Assalamu alaikum, uh, brother uh, Hassan and brother Abbas. Uh, it's uh, thank you. always a pleasure you articulate information in the most uh, eloquent manner. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. If I heard correctly, you have implied and reiterated that human beings are innately or inherently insecure. Are you implying that this is deliberate by the, by the Almighty Allah? Or uh, there are notions, for instance, that argue that we're a product of our environment. Um, can you shed light on this controversial topic of nurture and nature, for instance, and how it uh, relates to insecurities and jealousy? Good point. Very good point. It is inherent in us. It is by design. Allah said, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ We have indeed created mankind in a state of trepidation, and the word that is used in Arabic is kabad. Kabad is the same word used for liver. Liver is the most stressed organ in the human body. No organ is stressed more than the liver. And Allah uses that analogy. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا Indeed, there's no ambiguity, no doubt. Insan has been made to be in a state of insecurity. By design. Now, why is that? You see, the object of a created being is always dependent on the Creator. This is a scientific term I'm telling you. You will study that a finite entity, which you and I are, cannot exist without the infinite entity. But the irony is, a finite entity cannot possess the infinite. It's a contradiction. Because if I possess the infinite, 
then I become infinite. So I'm always moving towards the infinite, but I'm never infinite. So Allah says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Indeed, you are from Allah, and you're returning to Allah forever. So that insecurity by design is not is innate in the created entity. No entity can be eternally secure without the absolute. But the difference between an entity like a rock and you and I is that we're intelligent entities. And we have the power to reject the trajectory towards Allah, which is where the nature versus nurture argument comes in. As you know, nature is the genetic material and all the componentry that Allah has placed in us that is beyond our control. The chemical, the mechanicals, the genetic, the DNA. The nurture part is the environment we create for ourselves, how we deal with a person, the experience. All these things are nurturing parts. So I think it's a combination of both. But if you're going to ask the intrinsic nature of nature, and the this is the insecurity. But the nurture part is what stabilizes the nature part, which is that when I have Iman, and I'm ready to be annihilated a thousand times because I love Allah, Allah says, now you have become secure. So the companions in Karbala, like Muslim in the Ausajah, says to Imam Hussein, if I came on this battlefield and I was killed, and I came again and I was killed, look at the nature, see that? The physical is being annihilated. He says, a thousand times I will not stop protecting you. So Allah says, look at his spirit now. When a person elevates his nature to the spiritual level through nurture and latches on to the rope of Allah firm, you see, فَقَدِ Hold on, it won't break. Allah says, now you got security. You will hold on to the rope of Allah, it won't break. Allah says, now you got security. Only my rope gives you security. So by the natural law, the physical entity is always weak. But when it latches on spiritually to Allah, it becomes permanently strong. I think that's where the, the analogy goes. And truly, truly, we've seen people who are driven with a vision, we call them heroes because they're willing to give up all their material gains for a higher goal of status in honor and dignity. You can't compare the two. If I say to a man who went out there to capture a land because he wanted to be rich and he got killed, I don't call that person a hero. But that person went to capture the enemy to stop the injustice for a greater justice. Intangible. Justice is not tangible. You cannot touch justice. It's intangible. It's not material. It's immaterial. We call them heroes. Nobody can dare call the first one a hero. Oh, he went to capture land. He wanted to be a greater, you know, he wanted to be a greater king, and he died. We don't call them heroes. There's no heroism there. But, but, but he had the guts to go and fight. Yeah, but his guts were driven for wealth. There's no heroism there. But when your guts are driven for spirituality and higher status, we call them heroes. So we only have about five or ten more minutes, and we're going to try to get through as many questions as we can. Mm -hmm. There are two kinds of hasad. One is where we are not accountable for it, where you wish to have what the other person has. And the second one is you wish to have what the other person has, and you wish for this person to lose his blessings. How can we combat the first since it's hard to how can we combat the second one since combat since it's hard to combat the first one? I didn't quite understand the question too well. I apologize. You're saying that a person is jealous of what somebody else possesses, and we wish that... I mean, I, I, can you read that question again? Yeah, yeah Sorry. I don't think it's written properly, but um, there are two kinds of hasad. One oh, is... Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, then continue. One is where we're not accountable for it. You wish to have what the other person has. And the second one is you wish to have what the other person has. But we don't want them to have it. Now yeah. the first one is not hasad. There's nothing, there's no hasad thing. If somebody has it and I want it, and I cover it too, and I go after it, to want it, not at the cost of belittling anyone else, it's fine. I see a brother's got a, a, you know, a nice phone, and I say, wow, I like this phone. This is really good, it, it serves me well. I go get, another, I go get one, that's not jealousy. 
So that's not jealousy. Jealousy is to not like the other person having it. If I like the person having it and I want it, it's not jealousy. That's, that's competing in the real world. And the Quran says, go for that. Look at what others have, but evaluate. If my friend has a lot of wealth and I want it, Allah says you're going in the wrong direction. Look at the one who's got knowledge and go after it. Look at the one who's got hikmah. Look at the one who's got patience. Look at the one who knows the Quran and want it. Look at the one who's got iman and humble and, and loving and caring. I want that. Everything else will come to us. It's amazing how the human race is chasing money. And there are people who can't even speak properly they got money. You know, like I've got geniuses who have PhDs who don't have money. So Allah is saying, look, I give it to whoever I wish. You think it's only with the brain you get money? No. I even give it to dumb people. You know, give it to the, I, sometimes I deny the smart one and I give the dumb one. But when it comes to hikmah, knowledge, wisdom, iman, only the chosen ones, right? We are all chosen. And Imam Ali Yassam says, shame on us all. Allah has decreed our wealth, we're all busy ch chasing it. Whereas Allah has commanded us to gain knowledge. The Prophet says, Acquire it from cradle to grave. Are we bothering with that? Believe me, some of us have grown older. How much knowledge do we have? We live in Canada. How much knowledge do we have with interfaith? How much knowledge do we have with a Christian? Can I bring a Christian to my house or in the, in the office and talk to them? Meaningful? That I can extract knowledge and tell them you're wrong here, and you're right here, and I'm right here. I'm wrong. Can we do that? No. How about Sunni Shia dialogue? Do we have the, the guts to dis discuss as brothers? Not to fight with each other, but to bond each other closer, to bring unity. Not to divide the Sunni Shia, to bring unity, to say we are brothers. Our Shahadatain is the same. Our goals are the same. Our Tibla is the same. How can we unite with each other? How can we stop hating each other? Can we quote verses in the Quran and say, come, let's sit down. Do we have that knowledge? How about our history of Karbala? How shallow is our knowledge? History of Islam, history of the Prophet. Seriously, brothers and sisters, knowledge is power. Mothers who have knowledge empower the children. Fathers who have knowledge empower the children. Please, get it, get it. At any price, get it. And don't say I'm dumb. It starts with one thought and it grows very fast. You don't say I don't know the Quran. It starts with one ayah. Oh, I don't know the Quran. I say, I challenge you just to know one verse. Even a, the shortest verse. Know it. Tell me what it is. Do you know it? Say, yes. Have you pondered over it? Because it will grow to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. But you know, you know so many verses of the Quran. Okay, so this is the last question. Um, my non-Muslim friends requested that I explain the reasoning behind not being able to sit at a table where drinks or drinking is present. I think the explanation, um, i.e. God will curse me for being around those who are drinking, is too harsh and will make them feel judged and their choices, values, disrespected. How do I explain this in a sensitive manner as, so as not to offend them? Okay. You notice the question had an implication of, of being apologetic. When we're apologetic, we should only be apologetic on entities that have value. Alcohol is a destructive drug. I don't see how I can mitigate that in an apologetic way. Now, there is a cultural scenario in societies where drinking is the norm. Just like people drinking Coca-Cola and Pepsi and water, to them a six-pack is just the, the norm. But the reason it is the norm, sadly, is because no one is calling it a bad thing. In the world of science, we know alcohol is a drug. According to the United States law, FDA, Food and Drug Administration, alcohol is technically a drug. But because of legislation due to special interest groups that have penetrated our system, they insist that we do not call it a drug. Because if it comes as a drug, it has to be controlled. And when it gets controlled, it doesn't sound good that you're a drug addict. See, in society, a drug addict doesn't sound good. So they manipulate the words. They try to make it look okay. So today, Hollywood, you know, when, you're, when they're being asked in interviews, says, yeah, yesterday I got trashed, you know, I was drunk. You know, 
I was I was so drunk, I had no idea what I was doing. Everybody says, Wow, you're so cool. Oh, that was so much fun, you know. It's all fun. Let's go let's go get drunk. Let's go get trashed. It's like a, a fun thing. Someone like let's jump in the water. That analogy comes to me that way. In my university it always used to be that way. It was like normal. We're gonna get trashed tonight. And I said, Really? Really gonna trash yourself? They said, Yeah, this is life, you know, this is how we live. I used to say to myself, Wow. I see the power of suggestion that if I can think of it as normal, God forbid I'd be a cannibal tomorrow. It'd be normal to cut a person up and eat them. Human nature, when we normalize things, it becomes it becomes obvious. Killing becomes obvious. Killing machine even. You know, the soldiers who go to Afghanistan in space, they've been normalized. You know, they have fun. Look at the stories we see. They kill a little child in Afghanistan a family, and then they take a picture. Look, we just killed this one. You have the audacity to take a picture? Shame on you. But it's normal. We've been trained. We've been, we are zombies. We're walking, killing machine zombies. You like that? When I think about somebody, you know, I have one worker who works for me. He was in the, he went to Iraq as a soldier. I said to him, did you kill? He said, yeah. I said, how do you like it being a killer? He looked at me and says, I hate it. I said, yesterday before you went, you were a normal man. Are you normal now? He said, no. I'm living with PTSD. I have a desire to commit suicide on myself every day. Do you know in the United States, every single day, there is at least one soldier killing himself? There's about 390 to 400 soldiers a year, statistically, who kill themselves in the army. So that means one, at least one a day, if not two a day. Why are they killing themselves? Because it's the normality has its repercussions. Alcohol is destructive. You should watch a, there is a um, documentary that's available on Amazon and on Netflix on the prohibition, the alcohol prohibition, how the prohibition took its grounds in the United States. It's a very good thing to watch, to see how the very core of American citizens knew this is the devil. This alcohol is evil, it's vicious. Women used to come on the streets and smash the bars. Who were the ones who were fighting for the bars? The Europeans, the Germans, the Irish. They, if you look at all these major beer companies, they're mostly German companies. Bush, these are all Anheuser-Busch, these are all German companies. You find they came and they paid money and they paid money. The government couldn't stop them. The prohibition. Eventually they conquered. And we're all slaves. But today you can't say a word against alcohol. So that question implies that if I walk away from somebody having beer on the table or wine, oh, they'll feel bad. That's how normal it's become. That today even being gay, you can't say bad things. Oh, shh, you can't, because it's normal. Don't you dare say anything else. That's the problem. We are being bombarded at every level, immoral level, where it's becoming normal, that I remember the hadith of the Prophet, he said, there will come a time for our Muslims to practice Islam will be like holding red charcoal in your hand. Try holding red charcoal. You'll be like this. You can't hold it. He said, that's Islam. It'll be like holding red charcoal. It'll be, it'll be very difficult. Because today, to practice it is very difficult. So I asked myself, what am I supposed to do under this condition? Allah says, hold on firm. Build a little community. Immunize yourself. Well, the reason we need the camp is for this reason. I know there are thousands of youth out there having fun in the summertime. I said, what can I do to immunize that? Take a portion of that. Let them have a taste of a different lifestyle. Day to day. Here, when you have madrasas, you have these programs. This, these are all damage control. This is all called immunity right here. I'd rather sit here because today is what? Friday night. Friday night, the clubs are starting to, you know, they're getting heated right now as you speak, right? The lines are forming. But we're here. It's called damage control. I have options. I can be here, I can be in the club. No one's going to stop me. But Allah says, one more step. Delay it. Maybe tomorrow you'll die. And if today you spend this time, maybe your soul will be saved. That's the only way to hold this red charcoal today. So the argument of this walking away, don't feel bad. Now, how do you articulate? I said, listen, guys. It's how you carry yourself. Trust me, it's how you carry yourself. If you have dignity and honor and you know how to carry yourself, your friends will not bring wine or beer in front of you. It's 
how we carry ourselves. Let me give you an analogy. Analogy. If you know how to carry yourself, even if you wear a fake Rolex, people think it's real. <laughs> and if you don't know how to carry yourself, even if you wear a real Rolex, it'll appear fake. It's all about appearances. The world is a world of appearances. Trust me. It's how you look, how you talk, how you gesture, how you raise your eyebrow, how you say things. You say, how do I learn that? Well, up and up and listen. Study it carefully. It's how you carry yourself. When people start seeing that, you don't have to say a word. They'll move everything. You just have to look at them. And if they don't, there is a way to approach that too. And if they don't, back off and walk out. They'll wonder, why do you leave? So listen, I'm just as important as you are. And I have my degrees. I can't take this. There are ways to express it. Your friends will recognize, oh, that friend is coming, don't open the beer. But in my life, I learned that when my friends and I used to go, you know, my parents, I'm the only son in the family. It's shocking when I think about it. If I was a parent, I'm the only son in the family. I have a sister, but I'm the only son. And my parents would let me go on ski trips for a week with my friends. You know, you know skiing with non-Muslim friends. All my friends were non-Muslims. We would travel. We would go. We would go in the summer. We'd go away for a week or a weekend. You know, I'd go water skiing and do things with my friends, American friends. I think about it today. If I was a parent, I would not let my son do that because, you know, the danger to it. But there was a rule I learned that if I carry myself with dignity, and these friends would come to my house, my parents would look, it's okay, we like this boy. They're all athletes, no cursing, we're all respectful. They're not Muslims, but very friendly. We would travel, they would go to the restaurants to see if there's any haram in it. Then they say, okay, we can stop here, we can eat. Right? They, would, they would choose for me places. They would remind me, I remember once I was on a, on a water ski, and I was skiing in the middle, I was having a great time, I was really feeling on it. And he stopped and he, you know, I went in the water. So I pulled in, he says, what, what's the problem? And I said, Alan, what's the problem? He said, well, we were looking, it's prayer time, so we're going to bring the boat back, and you'll go for your prayers. I said, wow, oh, that's amazing. You remember my prayer time. I was busy having a good ski time here, and you remember my prayer time. Because Allah SWT says, you carry yourself, your friends will remember you, but you have to carry them a certain way. I'm not claiming to be anything special. It's almost like Allah taught me through them that your religion is so powerful, even your non-Muslim friend would honor you. I learned that, and from that day onwards, there was no looking back. I am not afraid of anybody. I'll meet even CEOs of companies. I see alcohols, I'm sorry. I don't agree with this. And I have a reason. And I'll, I'll unleash statistics. I'll unleash medical records. I'll unleash anything you want. I'll prove you wrong. Why? Because Allah says, Bring the Dalil, Hatu Burhanakum in Kuntum Sali. Show it to him. He'll respect you. He'll honor you. Don't be afraid of him. He's nothing. Who is he? Who is he? When you're sick and you're about to die, he's going to bring us all back. No. So don't be afraid. But prepare yourself. Now, it's easy for me to say, you might say, but for me, it's very difficult. Take that one step. Look, simple example, I'm sorry to make this long. In Tanzania, I was just telling the brothers yesterday. In Tanzania, I stayed at a brother's house. I'm always his guest when I go to Tanzania. He's a wealthy man. Some of you know him, those of you come from Tanzania. This brother is a wealthy man. He owns a dealership. He has a, a car dealership, Hyundai dealership. So to get the dealership, these are brothers, they don't look very religious outwardly. You know, they're not zealots. They don't have, uh, they don't look like they're just totally submerged in God's thought, you know. Just, they're good people. But they're firm in principle. Right? They got the option of getting the, um, the dealership exclusive in Tanzania, which is East Africa. So they were called to Korea. They went to Korea. And now the heads of Hyundai are interviewing them. So they're sitting in a restaurant and they're going to be interviewed. Uh, and they're going to have an interview. The two brothers sit and the two heads of Hyundai are sitting there. And they're having a conversation. They order one in. So the wine comes, and the wine is on the table. So the two brothers says, excuse us, um, if you don't mind, we don't like to sit on the same table where alcohol is served. So you guys drink all you want. When you're done, call us. We'll come back and continue our conversation. Now, how many of us would have the guts to do that? 
This is a multi-million dollar deal here we're talking about. This is not a penny. This is a lot of money. <laughs> this is exclusive dealership in Tanzania. This is a lot of money. Right? You have guts. They stood up, walked out. Came back about 20 minutes later, the brother's coming. He says, we sat down, there was no wine on the table. We talked. In a few minutes, they said, we have decided to give you the dealership. No interview. He says, why? He says, anybody who's got guts the way you guys have, with the principles that you follow, we want to work with people like you. And they got the dealership. How I know this? I was in his dealership. He was showing me his dealership. He says, let me tell you how I got this dealership. It was so profound to me. He said, did you see that? He says, we were not afraid of losing it. For principle is principle. We don't care. I said, look how Allah honored you. That you got your wealth in, in the best of ways. And look how Allah honored you. So let's not think that if I'm going to walk away, so my friend is going to get angry and they're going to get very disturbed. Don't be afraid. There is a way to approach. And Allah will give you success. If you haven't stuck in that, let's say, I'm, and this is a, a rule. Let's say I have a situation where a beer is there. I'm very uncomfortable. I don't know how to move. If I move, these guys are all going to start talking. And I, I don't know how to manage this. Read the dua. Read, ask Allah, oh Allah, I believe in you. Give me victory here. I don't know how to manage this. Open a door for me. Do something. I don't know what to do. There's a best dua in the Quran. It's, رَبَّنَ افْتَحْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ قَوْمِنَا بِالْحَقِّ وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الْفَاتِحِينَ Oh God, give me a victory between me and my community. And you're the best of victors. You'll be surprised. You'll say something, they look at you, you'll walk away. They say it. We apologize for not getting through all the questions, but inshallah, Brother Rajabali will be back soon to answer them. That brings us to the end of our program. We'd like to thank Brother Hassanin for coming to our community again. We hope to see him back very soon, inshallah. Before you end, I think we should do dua. Sorry to interject, I apologize. Are you going to do dua? Sorry? Are you going to do dua? Speaking of dua, let's recite dua. Inshallah, as you know, the situation right now in the Middle East with this uh, decadent king, Abdullah, about ready to meet his lord. Um, there's a riwayat that there will be a king whose name is Abdullah. He will die. And something incredible will happen in the region. Only Allah knows we're hoping it's this. Because the riwayat shows a parallel. Something great will be happening in Syria. And a country with a red flag will come in and there will be a zone happening before the Imam appears. Henry Kissinger has already mentioned the state of Israel shall not exist in 10 years. Kissinger, who's the father of Zionism, says that something is percolating. So we hope, inshallah, that the Imam Sahib Zaman comes in our lifetime. We hope that justice and equity for the world does not have to be enslaved and be taken down like uh, the way the world is right now. There's too much blood being paid, too much, too much killing. We can't wait for this to stop so we can all be happy and live as human race with dignity. So let's make dua that Allah bring our living Imam back as soon as possible Amen. so that we can rise and learn from him and submit to Allah the way Allah intended us to be. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma inna narghabu ilayka في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتذل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيله وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة Let's recite together اللهم كن لوليك الحجة من الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين صلاة الله <تصفيق>